Would you turn in your Bibles with me, please, to the book of John and chapter 14. The book of John and chapter 14. John chapter number 14. <clears throat> Beginning with verse 1, John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. This is a most unusual time of year. As a matter of fact, I don't think it is, it is equaled uh, by any other time in the year. Not just because it's a momentous occasion when which we reflect on the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's all the activity that goes on all around us. Here is a, a season of the year where you are either very happy or very unhappy. The seeming cloud that comes over so many lives in this time of year, and I'm sure that it's for many, many reasons. Uh, maybe things don't turn out like people think they should. And that's interesting to me. I, uh, I've seen fellows get awfully upset over people who said bad things about them that weren't true, but never get upset with anyone who says good things about them that aren't true either. <laughs> and so, I think sometimes our expectations uh, created an atmosphere in our own hearts and minds that give us difficulty. Here the Lord Jesus says to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. If you'll go back with me uh, to chapter 13, uh, for the next couple of hours we'll work our way up to 14 and then Spend an hour or two there, and, and then finally uh, go home. John chapter 13, the, the Lord is with his disciples. This is where they're going to uh, have the supper together. And we learn in the very beginning uh, of this chapter that our Lord loved his disciples. Verse number 1 of chapter 13, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of the world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. He doesn't, he doesn't stop short. He loved them to the end. Now the Lord Jesus recognizes and realizes perfectly that his time is very short. He's... He's going to be leaving. And when, when the uh, events begin to take place that will bring him to that end, they're, they're going to happen rapidly. And so he's going to try to prepare his disciples for that event. And he'll do that, he'll begin to do that <clears throat> right now. When they're going to have this supper together and when they've finished the supper, uh, then he's going to get up and lay his uh, garment aside and gird himself with a towel. And he's going to go around to each of these disciples and he's going to wash their feet. And he's going to take the towel and dry their feet. And he comes to Simon Peter, of course, and, and, and Peter said, you're going to wash my feet? And, and he says, uh, yes, I am. And he said, no, you're not going to wash my feet. He said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And he said, well, wash my, my head and my hands and everything. And the Lord said, I've done that already. You only need that your feet should be cleansed. But he said, not all of you here with me at this supper are cleansed. And he knew that Judas, of course, was going to uh, betray him. <clears throat> and so after he finished washing their feet, he sat down and he said to them, uh, do you know what I have done? 
And he doesn't even give them the opportunity to answer. He just moves on forward. And, and the conclusion was this. If I, your master, am willing to serve you by washing your feet, should you not be willing to serve others? Are you greater than your master? And the answer is obvious, isn't it? No, they were not greater than their master. And so when he comes down to the 17th verse of the, of the third chapter, he said, if you know these things, if you understand what I've done to you, you know, there are a lot of things I think we know, but maybe fewer things that we understand. Yes, I know you wash my feet, but do you understand what, what was taking place when I was washing your feet? So he said, if you know these things, or if you understand these things, happy are ye if you do them. And the word do there is to practice. It isn't you just do it one time and, hey, happiness is overwhelming. No, it's you understand what I'm doing to you, and then you go out and practice what I have done to you, and he said you will be happy, or you will be blessed, you will be joyful. Many, many times through the years, as I've turned to this passage, I have asked congregations, how many of you here with me tonight want to be happy? Do you know not... Not a single occasion that I've done that have I had everyone to, to raise their hands. Never. You say, well, some of them, you know, they just don't want to lift their hand. They just don't want to do it. No, no. I, I've met people that if you, if you made them happy, they'd get mad at you. They're like little Linus. You know, they have a cloud that's hanging over their head all the time, and it looks like the thunder and lightning's ready to pop out and the rain is about to fall. They just live that way. I, I can't comprehend why you would want to do that. I've, uh, back in the years of pastoring, I, I counseled couples. And, and I, come to the, I came to the conclusion that some of them just love to fight. Why would you want to live in this kind of misery? Wouldn't it be easier that if the other person is altogether wrong, wouldn't it be easier to just change your life to accommodate them just so you could have one good night's sleep? But some people just enjoy the pleasure of misery. But we don't have to. And the Lord Jesus gives the formula here. If you, if you understand what I've done and, and you will practice it in your life, he said you will be happy. And the thing that he taught them was, you learn to live for others. The Bible is filled with people who went through extraordinary cir circumstances. And, and you might ask them when they were, uh, Moses for instance, Moses, why did you put up with them? When God said, just step aside, Moses, I want to destroy the whole crowd. Why didn't you say amen? Can I help in any way? He didn't because his life was given for others. Isaiah, God gives him a ministry and tells him, you're not going to have any good results. Why did he keep going then? Why did, he, why did he continue in the ministry? Why didn't he just give up? Because I think he didn't start out for himself to begin with. He started out for others. I think of Jeremiah in a pit. He's looking up. The only light that he can see is straight over his head. And, and he just throws in the towel. He said, I give up. I'm not going to preach anymore in his name. And then the very next breath, he said, oh, it's a fire burning in my bones. Well, Jeremiah backslid for half a verse. Huh? If you can shorten it to that, you'll probably get along pretty good. Over and over again, Paul, how, Paul, how did you keep getting up? Others, Lord, yes, others. Let this my motto be. Help me live for others, Lord, that I might live like thee. Lord Jesus, how is it that you could, you could leave 
a place as wonderful as heaven and come to this earth and take on the form of man and be abused as you were and then crucified on a cross. How could you do that? I think the Lord Jesus would say it was others. Others, Lord, yes, others. Let this my motto be. Help me live for others, Lord, that I might live like thee. What are you anticipating Christmas? Are you anticipating what you can get or what you can give? I think we probably have proven in our country that getting does not necessarily make one happy. I think oftentimes of of California and Hollywood and <clears throat> how much money and prestige they've made and, 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 and buy multi-million dollar houses and, and live in rehab centers. I've often thought, why don't you just build a rehab center? Call it home. No, getting does not necessarily make one happy. But I believe the formula the Lord gives us here is very clear. We can be made happy by giving. And I think oftentimes we, we immediately think, I, I can't afford it. But you know, oftentimes it isn't a lavish gift that needs to be given. Sometimes it's a kind word, a warm handshake or an embrace. There might be those occasions you say, well, I, I, I just don't have a lot. I was, remember years ago I was standing by a fellow in a missions conference. I was getting ready to preach, but a missionary was given a, a testimony, and, and he wanted to raise $5,000 to finish buying a building in England. And uh, the fellow beside me got really burdened about that. And with tears in his eyes, he turned to me and said, Brother Whetstone, if, if I had $5,000, I'd meet that need. I said, Brother, don't you worry. There's some $5 needs out there too. But oftentimes we're so focused. If, if I can't do something magnanimous that everyone will pay attention to, then I'm not going to do anything at all. How about... We look for opportunities this Christmas season to say, I want to do something for someone that can't do anything for me. Who doesn't even know my name? Whom perhaps will not even know where the kindness came from. I want to do something to lighten the load of someone else's life other than myself. If Christmas is only going to be happy by what we get, then our happiness depends solely on what others are willing to do for us. But if our happiness depends on what we are willing to do for others, we can be as happy as we want to. If you know these things, he said, happy are ye if you do them. Well, then he's going to uh, reveal to them that Difficult times are coming, that there's one among them that's going to betray him. Uh, John is leaned on the breast of the Lord, and when the Lord acknowledges this, Simon Peter evidently is a little ways away, and he's motioning uh, to John. He's, you have the prime opportunity asking, who is it? And John does. And the Lord says, the one to whom I give the sop. That sop, though it's in the verses right here immediately, I'm quite certain there was some time that lapsed during this dinner uh, before the Lord gave Judas the sop, and probably no one paid any attention to it at that moment. And then when he had given him the sop, he said to Judas, he said, uh, what you are going to do, do it quickly. And Judas is going to go out. Well, the others probably 
gathered that since he had the money back, the Lord was sending him on a quest to go get something that, that they didn't have. And so Judas will go away. Now the Lord is going to instruct his disciples on what he wants them to do now that his time with them is shortened. And the challenge to them was very simple in verse number 35, or excuse me, 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to the other. There isn't a soul in this room tonight that couldn't love other people. It doesn't cost anything. It's, it's, it, it's harnessing the ability to look beyond ourselves and say, I'm interested in someone else more than I'm interested in myself. And so he challenges them. You might not be able to do great things for each other, but you can love one another. And he said, by the way, it's going to be a badge that you wear by this, by loving one another, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. He didn't say by great faith is everyone going to know that you're my disciples. He didn't say if you can memorize the whole New Testament that's coming your way, then everyone will know that, that you love me. No, he said if they will witness in you that you love each other, it will be the badge that you will wear to announce to the world something is different about us. So I, I tell you, brother Whetstone, I, uh, so and so, he comes to church with us, and and I do my best to love him. But I tell you, I just, I just don't like the way he behaves. I don't, I don't know any place in the scripture that you're required to like anybody. And we do have likes and dislikes, don't we? I mean, there's some people uh, that you might want to spend a little time with, maybe even, maybe even have, a, have dinner with, but you don't want to take them on vacation with you. And then there are other people that you could spend all your time with them. You, there's something that meshes between you and them, and, and you want to be with them all the time. And so in this matter of loving each other, there's going to be differences of attitudes and opinions toward certain things, but those things should not keep us from loving each other completely. Even to those that perhaps do things we don't particularly like. I don't know that anyone just is born to love everybody. I think it's an art that we perhaps have, but we have to hone. Because the easiest thing in this life to do is to be consumed with self. How is it going to affect me? And I think the Lord Jesus is doing everything he can to say the, to the disciples before he is gone, hey, listen, I want you to pay attention to me. I want you to serve others, and I want you to love each other. It is his proposal that this will go a long way to bringing happiness in our lives. So after all of this now, Simon Peter says to him, uh, I don't care what anybody else does. I'm, I'm going with you to the death. And the Lord Jesus said, Simon, I know you don't know it now, but you will very soon because before the rooster crows in the morning, you're going to deny me three times. I've heard people say I would never do I'd be real careful. That word never is a long time. Perhaps there are a lot of things we don't want to do or we hope we never do, but to just boldly say, I would never, 
I want to tell you anything flesh has ever done, your flesh is capable of doing. So the Lord says, okay, I'll, I'm going to wash your feet. I'm going to give you some instructions. I want you to love each other. I'm going to go away. And then the very next verse is chapter 14 and verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. We can only imagine how troubled their hearts really were. After three years of, of, of walking with him and talking with him and, and seeing him perform miracles as, as though they were effortless. I mean, they were so convinced that he had the power to do anything that before he leaves the Mount of Olives, they'll ask him, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? You have the power to take the Roman heel off our necks. Will you do it? And now, he says to them, after these three years of miracles, he says, I'm leaving you. Well, I'm sure they had confidence in John's leadership. They surely had confidence in Simon Peter's leadership. But having those men was nothing like having the Lord Jesus walk with them day in and day out. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when every moment of our lives Jesus Christ is in our presence? When we no longer walk by faith, but we'll walk by sight, He will be with us. Well, these men enjoyed that for these three years. And so he says to them now, I want you to take courage. Let not your heart be troubled. Let me give you a couple of ways I think uh, that probably we can do that. First of all, trust in God's person. And that's what they had done. They had seen him work miracles. And as long as they were in his presence, I'm quite confident they weren't afraid of anything because there isn't anything that he could not accomplish. There's nothing he could not do. And so day in, day out, when they woke up and a new morning was before them, they had confidence because they had seen what he was capable of doing. But now he's going to be gone. Can I now, Peter, James, John, all the others, can I now, when he is not in sight, still trust him the way I did before? And perhaps that's the question for us as well. It'll not be difficult when we get with him. But can we trust him now? Jeremiah said in, in Lamentations, he says, Great is thy faithfulness. And there are a number of places through the Old and New Testament both that it says, great is our God, or God is great, or, or great is thy faithfulness, as, as Jeremiah said. Notice, it does not say God was faithful. It does not say God will be faithful. It says God is faithful. We can look at the scripture and, and maybe even read history of, of, the, of the Christian church and see how God has moved in so many ways to, uh, to bless and, and help his people. And we can say, oh, look what God did back then. And we can look ahead and say, oh, look at the, the great promises we have that God will complete in our future. But the question is, can we trust him to be faithful today, right now? Because I know God is going to provide streets of gold. Can that same God pay the light bill this month? Can that same God meet our needs today? And if we were more focused on meeting the needs of others might we find that our needs are more readily met? We live in an age of greed. We live in an age of self. He said, let not your heart be troubled. 
You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Hebrews says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Don't listen to the news long enough to get fearful. In the first place, they lie and do not the truth. Keep your eyes on Christ. As surely as those men could trust him when they could see him, they could equally trust him when they could not see him. And so can we. Trust in God's person. Secondly, trust in God's promises. In order for us to accept that he will do the things in the future that he said he would do, it would do well for us to dwell on those things that he has promised that he's already done. For instance, it was promised that he would be born of a virgin. Not, not just a young woman, though she was. Mary undoubtedly was a godly lady. I imagine it shames her that religion has so exploited her name. But I will not allow those who have driven her name beyond measure to cause me to lose sight of the fact that she was a holy woman that undoubtedly loved God. So much so that God said, I'm going to send my son to earth and I'm going to send him through Mary. He was born of a virgin. It was promised that he would live a sinless life. And he did. Not one act of sin did God ever commit in the Lord Jesus Christ. Ever. Cannot sin. You say, well, yeah, but what if he was coming up as a teenager? As a teenager, he didn't sin. As an adolescent, he didn't sin. As a child, he didn't sin. As an adult, he didn't sin. We were promised the, 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 the perfect Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world, and He came. We were promised that He would be the blood sacrifice for our sins, and He went to Calvary. You know in your heart that He fulfilled that promise by coming before Adam was ever created, he was promised to be the Messiah for a race that had not even yet lived. What an amazing God. Three days after he was buried, he got up out of the grave. The centerpiece of our faith is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He did come. He was born of a virgin. He did live a sinless life. He did die on Calvary. And three days later, he got up out of the grave and sealed our victory for us. Did you know we won? You said, but Brother Weston, the game's not over yet. Yeah. But we won. I hate to disappoint the world, the flesh, and the devil, but we won. The victory is already ours. Brother Sammy Allen say, used to say, we're not working for the victory. We're working from the victory. If you're saved by the marvelous grace of God, you're going to heaven one of these days. The victory is yours already. So let not your heart be troubled. And so now we have these wonderful promises and a multitude of others. But then this one, 
I will come again. As a matter of fact, he'll meet with his disciples on the Mount of Olives. And one of the last things, they will see him go into the heavens and the angels will stand by them and say, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. I'm telling you tonight, Jesus Christ is coming again. And it could be in our lifetime. You say, well, they've been saying that for 2,000 years. <clears throat> well, if they could say it 2,000 years ago, surely we can now. We're, we're at least 2,000 years closer than they were. He is coming again. Of that, there is no doubt. Trust in God's person. Trust in God's promise. And then finally, trust in God's provision. He's not only prepared a physical place for us, but He prepared a salvation for us that made us worthy to inherit that place. Oh yeah, the new Jerusalem will come down from God out of heaven. And yes, eternity will take place and, and everything that John told us in the book of Revelation about that marvelous place called heaven that we're going to live one of these days, it absolutely is all true. And it can be obtained by anyone willing to confess with his mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in his heart that God hath raised him from the dead. The scripture says, Thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You say, well, listen, I, I tell you what, I wish I could be happy. Well, you've got to start with this. Do you know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior? Because whatever happiness you have apart from Jesus Christ is going to be short-lived. The pleasures of sin are only for a season. Moses well recognized that, and so should we. He didn't say there were <clears throat> no pleasures in sin. He said they're just short-lived. But love of God, love for God and love by God will last forever. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if in this season of the year we could embrace the idea that what took place some 2,000 years ago was a miracle? And it purchased for us our redemption. Our Lord is no longer in a manger. Our Lord is no longer on a cross. Our Lord is no longer in a grave. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us tonight with the promise, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. But where I am, there ye may be also. I think... If my confidence was wrapped up in my flesh and this world, I'd have a very difficult time finding happiness as well. But that's not a world we have to stay in. Though we are in this world, we are not of this world. And we can find the peace of God that passes understanding no matter what happens on this globe. And there's some pretty bad things happening. But might I remind you, they have to. If you believe Bible prophecy, these things have to come to pass. You say, I wish not in my lifetime. Oh, in your children's lifetime? In your grandchildren's lifetime? Who are you going to choose to go through these times? Could be that God is choosing us to be the last generation before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in the rapture to snatch his church away. We're going home. 
If I were you, I'd be careful about running my roots too deep in this world because we're checking out of here one of these glad days and going home to be with the Lord. As a matter of fact, Paul told the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 2, 6, he said, we are sitting together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In other words, we're as good as in heaven. We, we can breathe a little celestial air. We're as good as with God in heaven right now. One day, physically. But since we've trusted Jesus Christ and been saved by the grace of God, we're as certain of heaven as we ever will be. So settle this in your heart tonight. If you need to be saved by God's grace, why put it off? Receive the greatest gift that can be offered to you in this Christmas season. And that is the gift of eternal life. And it only comes to us through Jesus Christ. And it doesn't take a lot of money to get it. It takes simple faith in Jesus Christ and a willing to confess that you're a sinner and that you want him to save you by his grace. He said, I will receive you. Well, he has. He's received us in salvation, hasn't he? But one of these glad days, he's going to receive us at home. Challenges are always part of life. But that doesn't mean that our hearts have to be discouraged and downtrodden. I'm not saying that you live every moment in hilarity. I'm not saying laughing has anything to do with it at all. But it will come. I'm saying to you there ought to be a deep, settled peace in all of our hearts, those of us who have been saved by His grace, that causes us to wake up in the morning and say, I'm in the hands of Almighty God. I'm going to face nothing today that will take Him by surprise. Do you know God has never, ever said, Oops. I didn't see that coming. Dr. Harold Seitler used to say, has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? He knows your every moment, your every heartbeat, your every day. He knows it. And if you're in the keeping of His divine hand, it's going to be all right. And when this is all over, and we're on the other side, Let's be able to take a little pleasure in knowing that we were faithful today. That in His sight, it'll be no problem. But right now, we need to understand that God is right now, this moment, faithful and will meet all our needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. The scripture is filled with the promises of his return and the promise that we will be with him, but only if you know him. We have loved ones, we have friends. This Christmas season will be a wonderful time to attempt to introduce them to this matter of salvation. I can't imagine facing what this world is throwing at human beings today and not having the Lord Jesus Christ to go to, to flee to. I know life's filled with troubles and heartaches and difficulties, and I know that no one ever gets everything they want. But maybe the problem isn't that we don't get everything we want. Maybe the problem is we want too much.
better to want less and get more than to want more and get less.